Amen. Good morning, Landmark Church. How you doing today? Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen. Amen. Thank you for being here. Thank you for worshiping with us. We have a couple things uh, we want to celebrate this morning. First, let me just give you an announcement. If you could show that slide up there about the times of prayer. This did not make the, the announcement video, and I apologize for that. But we are working with the Minister Alliance, and we are in a time of a season of Lent in the Christian calendar leading up to Easter. We are going to have a, a community service on Palm Sunday, and uh, that will be at Memorial Assembly of God. I'll actually be speaking at that service. Um, but up till then, we're going to have three times of a prayer prayer in different communities, so it's every other Tuesday, so this Tuesday night at Grace Chapel in Lexington, we'll have it, it is a come and go thing, you don't have to stay the whole time, just come in, pray for a few minutes and leave, but we just want to pray over our communities, we'll have one on the, the 22nd at Trinity United Methodist, and then April 5th will be at Wayne First Baptist, and so those are just once again come and go prayer times, a different minister will be leading every 30 minutes, and so we want to invite you out to that and preparing our hearts for Easter, Amen. Amen. Two things I want us to celebrate today, and we're so excited. Most of you know, if you've been here very long, we are not a church built on uh, number goals, numeric goals. I don't. I, I'm so glad that we're growing. And uh, to be honest, we are we are one of the few churches. Not saying this to brag. I'm bragging on the Lord. But we actually have more people coming right now than we did before COVID, which most churches are about 60 to 70 percent. We actually have more people coming right now than we did before COVID ever started. Um, that's not the thing that I'm that, but. We don't, we've never had number goals. We're not a church that just tries to get people in the door with some gimmicky entertainment. We want people to come because God is calling them here and because they know the presence of God is here and it's making a difference in their life. But I did reach out to our Connect Group pastor, Samantha and David Sykes, and told them, hey, this semester, let's try to reach a goal. Because our Connect Groups, um, as we grow and have multiple services, people don't know each other. So to me, our Connect Groups are the ways that people are able to connect, that iron sharpens iron, and they're able to make a difference in people's lives. So it was a big deal. So I said, hey, let's try this semester. Let's just see if we can get 200 people in our connect groups on one Sunday evening. We just meet once a month for four times. So let's try and see it. Never done it before. Didn't know if it was possible. You guys all came out last week to different connect groups. And our first one this semester, we had 220 people in our Sunday night connect groups. If you're a connect group pastor or an assistant, would you just stand real quick? And I just want to honor you. And here's the thing. Here's the reason that we are this morning. Yes, here's the thing. I'm not bragging on me. I have nothing to do with this. I attend a group. I listen and I get prayed over, but these guys are the ones that do all the group, all the work. And so thank you to Samantha and David Sykes for leading. Thank you to our Connect Groups pastors one more time. Give them all the hand. And to celebrate that, when you leave today, you may have heard of, um, I, I believe it's Eileen, is how you say it, but... Eileen's cookies are really good. We have those out there for you. Everybody can grab a cookie and a bottle of water as you leave today just to say thank you and to celebrate all that God is doing, and we're excited about that. And then secondly, something that um, I'm excited about, many of you knew, know during COVID, we built this youth building out here. We had a loan that a lot of churches got from the, the government. We didn't have to repay, thankfully, and so we started with that, but we had to borrow $30,000 to, um, to, to finish the building, and you guys voted on that. You know about that, um, but we had paid it down to a little over 23000 uh, A little while ago, we got a check for $25,000 to pay that off, so that building is completely debt-free. We are completely debt-free again, so I just want to say thank you. Praise the Lord for that. That came in, and so we are celebrating those things this morning. Amen? Amen. Once you stand to your feet, if you've got your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. I want to talk to you this morning from this topic, because he did we can. Luke chapter 4. Before we do this, I know I don't do this very often. My voice is not very good, but I just have had this little chorus in my spirit lately, and I want us to sing it together. It's just four words, so if you don't know it, you can learn it very quickly. Let's sing. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good. To me. Would you sing, He answers prayers? He answers prayers. He answers prayers. He answers prayers. He's so good to One more time, just sing, God is so good. Tell Him how good He is right now. God is so good, 
God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. Amen. We serve a good God. Amen. 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 Luke chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan. And was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing, and afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Then the devil, taking taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, all this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I will give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. And Jesus answered and said to him, get behind me, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then Then he brought him to Jerusalem to set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him if you are the son of God throw yourself down from here for it is written he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in their hands they shall bear you up lest you lest you dash your foot against a stone and Jesus answered and said to him it has been it has been said you shall not tempt the Lord your God now when the devil had ended every temptation he departed from him until an opportune time. Father, we are grateful today. Thank you that you are a good God, that you are so good to us. You are better to us than we deserve, and you've been better to us than we've ever been to ourselves. So, Father, we just thank you today for your goodness, for your kindness, for your love toward us. And, Father, as we understand what it means to live a life that can overcome, I just pray that you open our ears and our hearts right now to receive your word We ask all these things in the mighty and the holy and the precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Ghost and all God's people together said, Amen. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm glad I get to sit by you and you may be seated. (laughs) Because he did, we can. Because he did, we can. Have you ever had a moment in your life where you have this just great moment and everything seems to be going the right direction and everything kind of is coming together and it's great and everything's good and then all of a sudden life smacks you in the face and you feel like you're in the wilderness or you feel like you're going a different direction. Jesus has just come up out of the water. We'll talk about this at the end of the message. But he's just come up out of the water And the Spirit has descended on him like a dove. And the heavens have opened and the Father has spoke over him. And it's this, oh, glorious moment. (laughs) And then the Bible says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit. Don't misunderstand that. Jesus in this moment isn't tired, he isn't weary, he isn't burned out or worn out. He is full of the Holy Spirit. Things are good and straightway, immediately, he is led by the Spirit into the wilderness. That always messes with my theology because I think if I go through wilderness times, it is because of something I've done wrong or it's because it's the devil doing it to me. But the Bible says he is led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Wilderness Wilderness times are not just, they don't happen to us just because we do something wrong. Many times God gets us in this place because he is trying to teach us something. He is working in our life. But in Jesus' case, it's a little different. Jesus is in the wilderness because he's there to fulfill in 40 days what the children of Israel could not do in 40 years. There's a, understand, numbers in the Bible matter, and the number 40 is very significant. We see that throughout Scripture. We see 40 all over the place. And in this moment, we see Jesus goes, and for 40 days, I've taught you this before, but just hear this this morning. It's very important. The children of Israel are in the wilderness for how many years? 
40. 40 years there in the wilderness. And then they go through the wilderness and they go through the Jordan River into the promised land. Jesus does the exact opposite, the exact reverse of that. He's already in the promised land. But he goes through the Jordan River. He is literally baptized in the Jordan River. And he goes from the promised land in the Jordan River to the wilderness. Why? Because he is trying to do in 40 days what the children of Israel could not do in 40 years and that is to overcome that is to get through the wilderness and come out on the other side being an overcomer and overcoming temptation and sin amen and for 40 days I don't know why I always thought this I've been in church 41 years and I've been to Bible college and I should know this but to be honest I always assume for 40 days Jesus just fasted hung out with maybe some animals in the wilderness just sat around thinking, man, how long is this going to last? Was hungry, prayed a lot, and then right at the very end, the devil began to tempt him. That's not what happened. Read the text. For 40 days, the devil tempted him. What we have here is the record of the last temptation of that moment. That this is right before it's over with. But make no mistake, for 40 days he's been tempted. For 40 days it's happened. And we don't know exactly how it happened, but this is what I believe. Because some people want to take this and, you know, Hollywood tries to make something out of it. A snake slithered up to him in the wilderness and began to talk to him. And that began to happen. Or there was a veiled person with no face that begins to come up and talk to him as the devil. The truth is, I believe Jesus began to deal with this stuff internally, mentally, because that's how we deal with it. We deal with these things inside of ourselves. We have these temptations, and we battle them within ourselves. And for 40 days, Jesus battles the voice of the enemy coming to him and tempting him. The voice of the enemy is speaking to him for 40 days, and finally, he brings him these last three temptations. Hey, Jesus, aren't you hungry? Well, Satan, you're kind of stupid. I've been fasting 40 days. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, I'm hungry. Well, you got the power. Take this stone right here, make it bread, and eat it. And while you're at it, don't just make it any kind of bread. I mean, make it like a, you know, Texas Roadhouse roll. Put some cinnamon <laughs> butter beside it or something. Make it some good bread, Jesus, with some good butter and stuff. And then he says, you know what? God's given me authority. I'm the prince of the power of the air is what he's saying. I've got authority over these cities, these, the, all these areas. I can give you the power over them. Make no mistake. The devil doesn't have a, a stream, I mean, all authority. He doesn't have all power. But, but unfortunately, the, I do believe he does have some authority on the earth. We have a greater authority, but he does have some authority. And so here is Satan that brings him up and says, you can have all these. The interesting thing is this, Jesus was already king of kings and lord of lords. He, could have, he was going to have all those anyway, and he already did. But the devil's saying, hey, you don't have to go to the cross and suffer. You don't have to do all that stuff. I can give it to you right here. Just, just bow down and worship me, and it's all yours in a moment. And then he takes him up to the pinnacle of the temple and he, and he quotes scripture to him, which we'll get to later on, but he quotes scripture to him and he says, just jump off this because Psalms 91 tells us that if you fall off, the angels will protect you lest you dash your foot against the stone. Just jump off and realize how powerful you are and realize that you are taken care of. Just jump, Jesus, and you got this. And the devil does these three things and Jesus with, withstands these temptations. Jesus says no to him each and every time and as he does the Bible says Satan leaves but notice what it says it doesn't say Satan left him alone forever it said Satan leaves until another opportune time I got some bad news for you today but I'm going to give you a lot of good news the bad news is the enemy doesn't leave you alone he may stop for a while, but believe me, he's looking for every opportunity. John 10.10 10 says the thief comes but to kill, steal, and destroy. He's come to do that. He is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And that's some bad news. But the good news is John 10.10 10 doesn't stop there because Jesus said, yes, the enemy's come to do those things, but I've come that you may have life and life more abundantly. I've come to give you life to the fullest. I've come so that you can overcome. I overcame the temptations, not so that you don't have to, but so that you can overcome. Because he did, we can. Because he overcame, he has given us the power to be able to overcome. Amen? Amen. So three things about the temptation of Jesus. First, 
Because of his temptation, Jesus is relatable. Jesus is relatable. Have you ever thought, nobody gets me? Man, nobody knows what I'm going through. If they knew what I was going through, they would act differently. If they knew what, I was, what was happening to me, they would treat me different. Well, here's the news for you today. You may not feel like anybody on planet Earth knows what you're going through, but I've got news for you. There is one person who knows what you're going through, and his name is Jesus Christ. Here's what Hebrews tells us. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was at all points tempted as we are. Yet without sin. We have a high priest who knows what we're going through. He understands our weaknesses. He was tempted in every way. Now you say, Pastor, there were some things that are alive around today that weren't around in Jesus' time. He didn't have to watch TV when he was on a diet and see all this food showing up. He didn't have diners, dives, and drives that showed all this stuff when he's trying to lose weight and to be tempted. He didn't have some of the, the things that people have problems with and are addicted to now. They weren't around then. You're right. But I believe what what the Bible is telling us is Jesus was tempted with the spirit of every single thing we can be tempted with. It may not be the exact object, but it is the spirit behind it. And he's tempted with that same spirit in every single way. And what the writer of Hebrews is telling us, that we have a high priest who gets us. He is relatable. So when we go through something, we can never look at Jesus and say, man, you just don't get me. You don't know what I'm going through. Jesus says, man, come on. I do know exactly what you're going through. I can relate. I was tempted. I was tempted by the devil, and I overcame, and I can relate with you. I care what you're going through. I am with you in your struggle. I'm with you in your problems. I'm with you in your addiction. I am with you because I can relate. But guess what? I overcame it without sin so that you can be an overcomer and you can get through this and I relate with where you're at. Amen? Because of his temptation, Jesus is relatable. Number two, because of his temptation, Jesus is reliable. Hebrews chapter 2 says this, Therefore in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Because he went through it, he can aid those that are going through it. He is reliable. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he is reliable. He was made like us so that we could be made like him, so that he could help us. He could come alongside us and say, you know what? I was made like my brethren so that I can, you can rely on me. I can help you out of the problem. I don't mean this bad, but I say this all the time. But listen, I don't trust people many times in leadership that don't have a little bit of a limp about them. They haven't gone through some things. And I can be honest with you, I I was a pastor for several years before I experienced deep loss and tragedy in my own life. But that loss and that tragedy in my own life helped me to understand what other people are going through when they lose things themselves. And there's something now, before I could sympathize, before I could say, you know what, I'm sorry that happened. But now there is an empathy because I know what it's like to lose things. And I know what it's like to feel that loss. And now I feel like I can empathize with people to walk through that and help them understand. Jesus said, I want to know what you're going through so much that I am being made to suffer so I can look at you and say, I do know what you're going through and I am reliable. I am one that is with you. I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. And no matter what you walk through today, he is with us and every temptation and every problem and everything. Jesus doesn't leave us or abandon us. He walks with us through it because he is reliable. Amen. He is with us. That is the promise. The promise is that we won't have any more temptations. I wish I could tell you that. I wish I could tell you today, if you'll get saved, I showed the movie Hook the other day, I wish I could take Tinkerbell's fairy dust and just put it over you, and you would have no problems, and you would have no issues, and you would never be tempted by anything ever again, but that's not the Bible. But the truth is this, Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. 
And the good news is, even though we do have troubles, and even though we do go through things, we serve a God who has overcame already, and He is reliable, and He was made like us so that He could aid us that are going through temptations ourselves. Amen? Amen. He is reliable. He is, he is relatable. He is reliable. And then number three, I believe the Word of God is relevant. It's interesting, a lot of churches want to be relevant nowadays. Let's have all those things that make us relevant. Let's, let's be cool. Let's try to do all this stuff because we want everybody to know we're relevant. Here's the thing. You don't have to try to be relevant. The Word of God is as relevant right now as it was the day it was written. It is still the same, and the Word of God still speaks to our situations and to our hearts. I don't have to try to make anything up to make this relevant. I don't have to try to change anything to make it relevant. The Word of God speaks to our situations. It speaks it speaks to what's going on in our world. It speaks to what's going on in our lives. And this word is still as relevant today as it was 2,000 years ago. Amen? Amen? Notice how Jesus overcame temptation each time. He said, it is written. It is written. But it's interesting. Satan used scripture. Do you realize the devil knows the Bible probably better than you do? The, the Bible knows, the devil knows the word of God. He knows scripture. Demons know scripture. They know those things. And here's the problem. There's a lot of people that have the right belief, but they're not living correctly according to the word of God. And let me say to you this way. There's, there's a Greek word called orthodoxy. Ortho means straight. Think about orthodontist. What do they do? They straighten your teeth. So ortho means straight or right. Doxy means belief. And so you can have orthodoxy. You can have the right belief. But there's another word called orthopraxy, right practice. Praxy, where we get the word practice. You can have orthodoxy, you can have the right beliefs and not have orthopraxy, the right practice. You can believe what the Bible says, but not apply it to your life. You can believe the word of God, but not live according to it. And Jesus didn't just say it is written, he lived out what it was written. He was the word. And we are called to make the word of God relevant in our situation and not just to believe it, but to live it out. We should be asking ourselves, what is the word of God? say about that situation and then we should begin to live that way and realize we are called to allow the word of God to shape us and to form us we don't use the word of God the way we want to to get at everybody else we let the word of God get to us and inside us and shape us and mold us and we let the word of God change us because it is relevant and then when temptation comes we don't use wisdom we don't use pop psychology we use the word of God that is wisdom but we don't use our own wisdom we don't use some kind of outside thing we use the word of God and we say it is written this is what God says and that's how we're gonna live amen because we realize his word is the final authority we live in a, in a world right now where nobody wants to have they don't, they don't want a measuring line of truth people just say your truth is whatever your truth is and my truth is whatever my truth is and we're all gonna get along and have unicorns and puppies and cotton candy and everything's good now, I don't say this out of a hateful spirit, but the truth is, if there is no line of truth, then there's nothing to judge things by, to understand, am I living up to that? And the world wants to tell you, do whatever, it doesn't matter. That's not what the Bible says. We use the Word of God as our firm foundation. And our life is applied by the Word of God. And we take this and we use it. And we use it against the enemy. Because we tell Satan, it is written. You can't do that. Jesus says, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. He wasn't saying we don't eat. But Jesus is saying, you know what, we eat bread, but I also eat spiritual food. And I'm not going to live by bread alone. I'm going to live by the words that are coming out of the mouth of God. And Satan tempts him again. And he says, he looks at him and he says, I'm not going to get into that. I'm not going to believe it. I'm, it is written this. It, every time he says, it is written. And when he does, he uses the word of God and the truth of the word and the, the tri true practice of the word of God against the enemy. Amen? So how did Jesus overcome temptation? Two things I believe we see from the scripture that change everything. Number one, the Bible says he was full of the Holy Spirit. Even Jesus, he's God. 
But even Jesus, in his humanity, relied on the power of the Holy Spirit. Listen, if you think you're going to make it through life's trials by yourself, you got another thing coming. We can't do it in ourselves. We can't do it in our own power. Our own power gets us in trouble most of the time. Our own way of doing things gets us to the wrong place most of the time because we're trying to do it in ourselves. We're trying to fix the issue within ourselves. But I got news for you today that he sent the comforter, the Holy Spirit, so that you don't have to try it alone anymore. But now you've got the greatest power living on the inside of you. I said that recently. But understand, Jesus relied on the power of the Holy Spirit. And if you'll begin to understand that, that the way we live is full of the Holy Spirit. Why do I spend time in God's Word? Why do I pray and I spend time worshiping? Not just corporately, but individually. Because I'm allowing God to fill me up so I'm living every day full of the power of the Holy Spirit. And I realize Jesus overcame, not because because of what was going on around him but because of what was on the inside of him and if you understand you're not going to overcome temptation just by what's going on around you but you will overcome when you realize what is on the inside of you and full of the Holy Spirit you begin to live your life amen, amen. and then the second thing I believe is very important was what happened to Jesus at the baptism he goes under the water Holy Spirit, when he comes up, descends on him like a dove. By the way, about being full of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says that the dove remained on him. In other words, he lived with the Holy Spirit with him. This is before the cross, before the resurrection. So the Holy Spirit did not indwell believers at this moment. But Jesus was showing us what was to come. The Holy Spirit descends on him and stays with him. And then on the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, we are, the, the believers are filled with the Holy Spirit. Now they carry the Spirit. Amen? Amen. But when he, when he comes up out of the water, the, the, the skies part, and they hear a voice. It's the voice of the Father. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Later on, Jesus is going to hear that same voice on the Mount of Transfiguration. When I, I can see Peter up there with his big mouth just talking while Jesus is trying to do things. And literally, this is what the Father says. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. This isn't in the text, but I think he's saying, Peter, shut up and listen. <laughs> Quit talking and listen. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Twice, by the Father, Jesus is reminded of his belovedness. And I believe it was the calling on Jesus' life that kept him from giving in to temptation and problems. I want to say this very carefully in my own life because I, I don't want to come across being haughty or, or any way. I, I've made so many mistakes. If, if we put it up on the board today, we wouldn't have enough space up there. And I'd be embarrassed to tell you all the things I've done wrong in my life. So I'm not trying to tell you I'm perfect in any way. But when I was a kid growing up, I was called to preach when I was 11 years old. My dad, I, I, when I was two years old, um, I was standing and preach with a Bible, and I wasn't even talking really. I would just stand and point and preach. And when I was seven years old, um, my first grade teacher asked me, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I knew I wanted to go to Southwestern to college. And so I said, I'm going to, I'm living in Mississippi, but I told my first grade teacher, I want to be a preacher and I want to go to Southwestern. In first grade, I just knew that's what God wanted for my life at a young age. But at 11 years old, my dad said, Justin, you can't call yourself to preach. God's got to call you. We can't call you. God's got to call you. So you need to pray about it. So I began to pray in three days, and three is also a very significant number in the Bible. On the third day of praying for that, I never forget going into the bathroom. My dad was blow drying his hair in his underwear. I never forget that scene right there. Thank you. <laughs> I'm a very vivid person, so I have to think, I have all these images. Blowing, you know, it was the 80s, blow drying his hair in his underwear. Actually, that would have been 91, but anyway, 90, or 90, 90. My dad was still living in the 80s. But, um, so I walk in and I said, Dad, this morning the Lord spoke to my heart. And I, I felt that morning as I was praying, the Lord called me to preach. I preached my first sermon when I was 13 years old. And when I got into high school, I had friends that did what all the high school people do. You know, party, go out and do things. We, we lived in Mississippi, so it was a lot of going to the river, riding four-wheelers, drinking a lot of beer, just hanging out. You know, a lot of, a lot of partying on the river, that kind of stuff. And, and not that I didn't have friends. I wasn't the, the, like the, uh, I wasn't the most popular person, but I wasn't the most unpopular person. I didn't have tons of friends. I mean, I, didn't have a, I had plenty of friends. But I'll tell you what kept me. Now listen, I'm not telling you. Every time in my life that the enemy has tried to attack me, it's always been to my calling. 
And I can tell you what kept me from doing things at that age was my, the sense over my life. That since I was a young kid, people would pray over me and they would call me out in church and, and pull me up and they would say, God has a plan for your life. God has a calling on your life. And for whatever reason, I was crazy enough to believe these people that were speaking this over me. And it kept me from doing all a lot of things my friends were doing because I realized I had a calling on my life and I realized that I could, I could ruin that. if I. And listen, God can, God can resurrect that and restore that. Don't misunderstand me. But I understand understood in that moment. I didn't want anything to happen to this calling. And listen, over the years when I have made mistakes, it's because I forgot who God said I was. It was because I forgot who God said I could be. When I messed up, it was because I got in my own head and I began to think I was better than I really was. I began to think I can handle it on my own. And I strayed from that understanding of the calling. Not that I strayed from my calling, but I strayed from the understanding. Every time, that's where the enemy hit me. Because it was in that moment that I I forgot who I was called to be. And I want you to know today that God speaks over you. I don't care what you've done. I don't care how many times you've blown it. I don't care how many times you mess up. We serve a God of restoration. That the callings of God and the gifts of God are without repentance. That God still has called you. He has still gifted you. And I believe this. How will you overcome temptation? Number one, understand your belovedness. You are beloved of the Father. You are his child in whom he is well pleased today. You say, Pastor, you don't know what I even did last night. I don't care. He is well pleased. Not because of what you've done, but because of who you are. Because God looks at us and he says, do I like you doing those things? No. But I still love you and you're still the one I'm well pleased in. Not because of what we do, but because of who we are. And some people that scares. Well, Pastor, if you tell people that, they're going to live however they want. No, no, no. Listen, I've, I've, I've seen this time and time again. When you understand what God has done for you, it makes you want to live more right than you are living right now. It doesn't make you, listen, grace doesn't make me want to sin more. Grace makes me want to love more. Grace makes me want to serve more. Because I realize, yes, he still loves me. No matter what I do, he loves me. But you know what? That doesn't make me want to sin more. It makes me want to love him and serve him more. Because I realize that is a crazy kind of love. What kind of God would love me when I've blown it and i messed up? But it's because I am the beloved of God. And Satan, and, and excuse me, scrush. Christ overcame Satan and temptation because he realized this is who I'm called to be and nothing can get in my way. Nothing. And then I believe out of that, him understanding that, he understood his calling. And his calling is I'm going to the cross. And when you understand you are called, you're called to make a difference. You're called to live a life that is making a difference. If you're a parent today, you are called to live a life that is showing your children what it means to love God and to serve God. If you're a grandparent today, you are called to leave this legacy of making a difference. If today, I don't care where you find your season of life, the truth is you are called to leave a legacy of loving and serving and making a difference and allowing Christ to work through you. And when you get that calling on your mind, when all these things come your way, they don't tempt you. Because man, that is just going to derail your calling. Who wants that? Who wants these fleeting things. It's just a momentary thing. It's a momentary pleasure. And it may feel good for a moment, but it hooks you and it takes you in. And God is saying this, you don't have to live that way. Because I overcame, you can overcome. Because I went through temptation and I made it on the other side, you can. Because he did, we can. Amen? Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Worship team, join me. I'm almost done. This morning, maybe you walked in here with shame and guilt. Maybe you walked in here feeling beat down by life. Maybe you walked in here today feeling hopeless. Like my life doesn't even matter anymore. But I want you to know today, what Jesus teaches us through his temptation. We're in the season of Lent, and for the next 40 days, we will prepare our hearts for Easter. And this is reminding us that as Jesus went through the wilderness, he didn't do it with doubt and unbelief like the children of Israel did. They blew it because God, listen, it was not God's will for them to be in the, in the, in the wilderness for 40 years. You understand that? It was God's will for them to march right through the wilderness into the promised land. But they had 12 spies. Ten came back with a good report. We are grasshoppers in their sight. These are some big old dudes. They'll tear us up. Let's just stay out of there. But two, Joshua 
and Caleb. You know the two that made it when they reached the promised land 40 years later? Joshua and Caleb. And Caleb, at 80-something years old, looks at them and says, Give me that mountain. That's the one 40 years ago I knew God said was mine. But because of the doubt and unbelief of all these people, I had to wait. Listen, God right now wants you to understand. He is calling you into your promised land. And the devil is going to do everything he can to try to stop you. He is going to tempt you. It's no surprise. For those of you that are new to the faith, it's no surprise. And I say this all the time in different places, but it's no surprise. Whenever you get saved and you turn from those things, people that you haven't heard from in years, that you used to do stuff with, they get your number somehow and you've changed it eight times since the last time you talked to them. The devil knows what he's doing. He's not stupid. But here's the thing about it. We have to realize we serve a God that is greater than the enemy. And every temptation that comes, I believe God, the Bible says, God has made a way of escape. In other words, God says there's no excuse. He's not saying he's angry at it. It's what he's saying is this. I've made a way you can get out of this. You don't have to give in. You don't have to give in every time. And today, I'm not just talking about some kind of big sin things. There's all kinds of temptations that come our way. There's temptations a Christian just to be cold and to settle where we're at and to be okay. And that's a temptation. I believe we're called to pursue God with everything we've got. The enemy wants your faith to grow cold. The enemy wants you to grow cold in knowing God. The enemy wants you to sit here and say you know what I'm good I'm going to heaven one day I'm fine and God says that's not what it's about I want you to run after me with everything you've got until the last breath in your body is out of here and you see me face to face I want you to run after me and pursue me amen there's some of you maybe it's some sin that keeps pulling you in and God says you don't have to live that way you don't have to that I've given you my Holy Spirit and I've called you and given you a purpose and a plan and because of that, I've got something greater for your life. Will you stand up today? I want you to close your eyes where you're at. I want to do something today we don't normally do. But I have to be, be led by the Holy Spirit. Our prayer teams can join me down here. We're going to pray in a minute before we sing. Here's what I want to do this morning. We always want to give an opportunity for people to be saved. Last week, 19 people raised their hands to be saved. And we're excited about all God is doing. But this morning, I just feel like this is what God is asking me to ask you. This morning, if you don't know Him, we usually just raise your hand and pray for you. And we're going to do that again. But right now, for whatever reason, I just feel like you need to give the devil a black eye, like we used to say. And this morning, you need to say, devil, I'm not following you. I'm following God. And if today, make no mistake what I'm asking, if today you are not a follower of Jesus, but you're ready to surrender to him, maybe you followed him before, but you haven't been following lately, but you want to surrender everything, and you want to make him Lord of your life, I'm going to ask you to do something right now. Instead of just raising your hand, I'm going to ask you to step out of your seat and come down here and let me pray for you this morning and see God do that in your heart and in your life. So right now, if that's your decision, would you just make your way down here? Come stand right down here in front of me. I just want to pray for you right now. I want to pray for you. Today's my day to make that decision. I want to go after Him. I'm tired of doing it my way. I'm tired of following my own pattern. I want to follow after Jesus. I want to follow after Him. I want to make that decision. Today's my day to make a decision to follow Him. I'm turning over everything else and I'm done. Listen, I want some people that will help me to come up and just lay hands on these people. We want, we want these guys to know we're with them through this. That we are with them through everything they're going through. And that God is going to get them through that. God is going to strengthen them and get them through. Guys, right now, I just want you to, I want all of you to say this prayer after me. Say, Dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for forgiving me. Today I surrender my will to you. I'm not going to live for my desires. I'm not going to live by those temptations. But today I surrender to you. Thank you for changing me. Making me a new creation. Thank you for loving me. In your name I pray. Amen and amen. Father, I just thank you for these guys. 
I thank you for this decision today to say, Lord, I'm following you with everything that I've got. Lord, I believe today is a new day. There are new creations in Christ, old things that passed away, and behold, all things have become new. And Father, today they don't have to give in to temptation, but instead they can realize that you today have given them your spirit. And greater is he that is in them than he that's in the world. Father, give them the spirit of overcoming to realize they can make it and they can do it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Come on, give the Lord some praise for this. How awesome. Amen. Listen, we're going to end with worship today. But if you have anything in your life, you just want to give to the Lord. Maybe you're facing a struggle. Maybe you say, I'm a Christian, but I'm just facing some things today I need help with. Or maybe there's a, a need in your life that you need prayer. Maybe somebody needs to be healed in your family. Whatever it is, I want to encourage you. These altars are open if you want to pray by yourself. And I want you to spend some time let these people pray for you. And let's leave here knowing we can overcome. Amen. Amen. to